Hello, this is UCL Uncovering Politics, and this week we're taking a deep dive into online public shaming. Is shaming ever ethical? What are the consequences of public shaming? And how does online public shaming deprive an individual of due process? Hello, my name is Jennifer Hudson, and welcome to UCL Uncovering Politics, the podcast of the School of Public Policy and Department of Political Science at University College London. Today, we're looking at a brand new article, Online Public Shaming, Ethical Problems with Mass Social Media, by Guy Acheson at Loughborough University and the School of Public Policy's own Saladin Mechlid garcia who's based here in the Politics Department at UCL. Today, I'm delighted to be joined by one of the authors of the article, Saladin Mechlid garcia Saladin is an associate professor of human rights and political theory. His research focuses on the links between adopting different ethical theories and the implication that has for what we do in practice. He focuses on the ethical fields of human rights, justice, and international justice, and on key concepts in those fields, such as responsibility, duty, rights, complicity, and practical reasons. Saladin, it's a pleasure to have you here to talk about this article. Pleasure to be here. Let me start off by asking you what motivated this research. How, how and why did you become interested in online public shaming? Yeah, that's, that's a really good question. So it really started when I, I started to perceive, as many people did, uh, there was a kind of peak moment in social media when there seemed to be almost every other week a letter being written or a petition against a particular individual or just a simple campaign on social media, say Twitter or Facebook, that named specific individuals, accused them of being uh, morally heinous for one reason or another, often a, a reason that was actually quite difficult to get to the bottom of uh, unless you searched very carefully. So a lot of people who saw these things would not necessarily know what they were hating people for. And uh, and and we became quite worried in discussions with, with Guy, who's the co-author of the paper, we became quite worried about what this meant in terms of people's treatment of each other and also in terms of simple things like due process. Like if you are accused of a crime or something heinous normally and there is some kind of consequence for it, then normally you would expect that there would be some kind of process that allowed you to be able to state your case and respond to it and address it and perhaps even clear your name if if possible. But none of that was happening on social media. And then after it had exploded, uh, we also saw other publications coming out. For example, there's John Ronson's book uh, on You've Been Shamed. And we just thought that it was really important to get to the bottom of what was truly ethically problematic about this. And there's lots of various ideas flying around, but we wanted to pin it down to some core ethical notion of the problem with online public shaming. That's fantastic. And I'm really excited to talk about this kind of ethical dilemma or the ethical challenge around online public shaming. Let's talk about the way you start this article off. You set out this hypothetical case of online shaming. And in the example, there is a scholar who's researching penal reform and who's subsequently shamed for a tweet that suggests uh, that the murder of a police officer should be understood in context. So, you know, set up this this case in in the article for our listeners so that they can understand how this all comes together. Great. Thank you. Um, I should say that the example that we begin with, uh, although it's concrete in its details, it, it is a, an amalgam of various other examples of, of actual cases, things that really did happen. Most people, when they write about this, they mention the Sacco case, which is uh, a woman who tweeted something unfortunate and some people would say racist, uh, got on a plane and then arrived in another country to discover that she her career was in ruins and she had lost her job and various other things besides. But actually our, our cases were more concerned with people's views, their actual political and ideological commitments and how these can be uh, the source for an online shaming campaign. So in this case, we have a young scholar who uh, who does as you say, which is, first of all, is researching an area such as penal reform, tweets something like, this case where a police officer has been murdered has to be understood in context, quite an old-fashioned liberal view. 
Um, and as a result, a conservative media pylon happens, accusing her of being a cop killer apologist. Um, that builds up over time. She tries, she is on social media. Many people who face these kind of OPS, or online public shaming attacks, actually are not on social media until they realize what's happening. Uh, she is on social media and she tries to respond to the claims that she is this horrible thing, a cop killer apologist. Uh, in attempting to respond, she finds that eventually, as often happens in these cases, she's overwhelmed. Literally thousands of these uh, attacks are happening on her timeline. She can switch the timeline off or she can switch her account off and leave, but the online shaming will continue to happen because her name will continue to be traduced on the internet. Um, then as a result of that, people start to display negative dispositions towards her, both online and in real life, because she becomes known as the cop killer apologist. So there's a kind of reputational aura that's built around her by the mere fact that, say, several hundreds of thousands of people, in some case millions of people, have decided that she is a morally repugnant individual. And this is really important. It's about her character that's been introduced. It's not just she said something and it was not nice, or she said something we don't like. It's she is something. She is a morally repugnant individual. Um, and eventually this might lead to, for example, as has happened in some of the cases that we were looking at, the employer distancing themselves from her because they don't want to be associated with this aura of moral repugnancy. Uh, even her friends, perhaps, are thinking twice about whether they should be seen public with her because, you know, uh, pictures, videos, etc., can appear on the internet. Um, and really, in a very significant way, she is found to be delegitimized in public discussions. So when she wants to contribute to discussions about penal reform, she can't really be taken seriously because she is the cop killer apologist. That's her, the thing that will follow her around forever. Um, and as that continues, she begins to suffer psychologically and perhaps has suicidal thoughts and ends up, in our example, working as a bus driver. Again, that's taken from a real example. Thank you for setting that out so, so clearly. Um, let me ask very quickly, how is online public shaming different from cancel culture or is it? So I would say that it is different in the sense that it is a mere part of cancel culture when it, when it plays that role. So cancel culture is an attempt to delegitimize people and to remove them from public discussion. But it uses various means to do that. So to remove them from public discussion in the sense of making sure that others are inclined not to listen to them or they do not get an opportunity to listen to them. And that can take various forms. So for example, uh, deplatforming someone, so preventing someone from speaking, either by physical manifestation, preventing them getting to a speaking hall, shutting down the speakers at the hall, sabotage, uh, or by contacting the authorities and saying, don't let this person speak because they're a terrible person or they will say things that will be endangerment to the people that will listen to them. All those are forms of cancel culture. There's also media-based cancel culture in which people are delegitimized publicly in the media. But they don't necessarily have to involve shaming the individual. They can just involve you know, physical prevention. And so the, the bit we wanted to grab hold of and understand was that bit that happens online with the mass aggregation of views that attack specifically their character and reputation. And that seemed a, quite a distinct part of the cancel culture practice, as it were. Let's get into the, the kind of meat of your argument. So you argue that online public shaming, that the punishment that's involved here involves characterizing people's personalities and moral characters as unworthy of participation in certain human relationships. Um, and so they're socially excluded in this regard. And by imposing this type of punishment, it attacks the victim's moral standing, and that violates this basic form of respect you say we, we owe to all people. So in your characterization, online public shaming isn't you know, just kind of freedom of expression being exercised with some unfortunate consequence, um, even if desirable, where they might be carefully targeted. You really hone in on this notion of they morally wrong their target. And so I want to hear more about this concept of moral wrongs. Can you define this for our listeners and, and give an example? Yes. So 
moral wrongs exist in various areas in life. And I think we'd all recognize some of the basic ones. So, you know, if you teach your kids, it's basically don't uh, lie, cheat or steal are the basic moral wrongs. But there are other moral wrongs that motivate us to create legal uh, restrictions on people's behavior, but also to criticize other people for their behavior in interpersonal relationships. So typical, apart from lying, cheating and stealing, there's typically you know, moral wrongs such as the moral wrong of discrimination, right? This is one that gets codified into law as well as being a moral wrong. Indeed, the reason that we codify it in law is because we think people should not be treated that way, right? And we want to prevent it. So uh, usually moral wrongs either involve harms to individuals that are unjustified. So you can have a justified harm to an individual. So in self-defense, you can harm someone by twisting their arm to prevent them harming you. But where the harms are unjustified and tr basically indicate that that individual is of a lesser worth, then you have a clear moral wrong. And that's the type of moral wrong that we think is happening here with online public shaming. So just if I can clarify that, yeah. this is about a judgment that is collectively being made, that is publicly being made um, about a, a human being's worthiness? Yes. Is, 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 it, is it essentially kind of a worthiness argument? Indeed. So respect, so this is, there's a respect component to this, a strong respect component to this understanding of, of why OPS is a problem. So in the same way that... Um, the reason discrimination, say discrimination on the basis of race, is wrong is because you're indicating that just because this person has a certain racial characteristic or perceived racial characteristic, that they are less worthy than other human beings to receive treatment such as, for example, getting a job that they're qualified for or being allowed into certain public and social spaces. Just as those things are a reflection of people's attitude to them about their worthiness, then we are saying that that's what's happening with OPS. It's about respecting or failure to respect the worthiness of people as equals, people with equal standing in a public conversation. Um, and the thing that's more distinctive about OPS as opposed to discrimination, discrimination can happen just on one occasion by one person, right? But for OPS to happen, it requires at least the attempt to gather and aggregate numbers of people that are carrying out this kind of stigmatization activity towards an individual. You talk about um, shaming and shame in the article, and, and I thought this was really kind of profound. You make, the, you, you make a difference between um, kind of shame as an emotion and guilt, but yeah. shaming goes really to the core of, um, again, worthiness, but also it's a judgment um, that the person uh, who is the victim of online public shaming is being rendered full of, of shame. So tell us a little bit more about shame and why this is important to your argument. So shame can be understood uh, from two perspectives. It can be understood as an emotion, but it can also under be understood in the verbal sense as an activity or an action to shame someone. And uh, it seemed clear to us that in that second sense, the verbal sense, the activity of shaming people, it really didn't matter whether the, you were communicating to the individual that was being shamed anything at all. It didn't matter whether, what they got out of it, as it were, or whether they felt anything. Maybe, maybe it was desired that they felt shame, but actually the larger part of what was going on in this form of active shaming was to try and send a, a, a message to a third party, which is everybody who's watching, about what's going on. So typically, we see, for example, shaming activities that took place after the Second World War, where collaborators with, say, the Nazi regime in occupied France were publicly, this is in a public square, shamed by certain actions. They had their heads shaved. It's typically women who had collaborated in one way or another, but it, it often happened to the other sex as well. They had their heads shaved. They were spat upon. They were pushed through the streets. And effectively, the message here was, this person doesn't belong with us. This person is not an equal standing, of equal standing with us or an equal human being to us. And they really are being pushed out of the community and these things that we're doing to them are symbols of that pushing out. And it's that phenomenon that we wanted to capture in its very, very modern manifestation, right, 
of the public square, which is now the online public square and mass social media. That's a really nice analogy, I think, to kind of draw out the, yeah. the historical way that might have happened and how it really happens uh, in, in the social media realm. Now, in the paper, you talk about the wrongfulness of online public shaming or OPS in terms of its illocutionary role. So you're saying it's the type of action the Speech Act of shaming performs rather than its kind of perlocutionary effects it may have, such as emotional distress. Um, you know, this is a really important distinction that you are making here. So tell us more about the illocutionary role of shaming and why that's important for you rather than the shamed person's feeling or loss of status or loss of reputation. Yeah, so at, at this point, we we go back to that idea that it's an act perpetrated on someone potentially for the observance of others um, to, to watch, experience, or have a communication sent to them about what's going on. So that's why it doesn't really matter First of all, it doesn't really matter what the effect might be on the individual. Uh, but the wrongness of the act is also not, not really that dependent on the outcomes for the individual. So it could be conceivably possible that an individual could come out better from a public shaming. And in fact, in some cases they have. So a conservative individual is shamed for something that, you know, a progressive left or, you know, socially progressive people think is terrible but amongst his or her circle that actually is a form of kudos you know they've they've been shown to actually be one of the warriors for the conservative cause and as a consequence they get more speaking shows and they come out really well out of it that doesn't take away the responsibility for what's happened and it doesn't take away the idea that that trying to treat them as a non-member of a community of a social environment, trying to push them out in the way that the shaven-headed woman is pushed out of the public square in France is somehow wrong in itself, right? That's what the elocutionary idea is. It's that the meaning of what you're doing is, is problematic and wrongful, even if this person happens to get something great out of it at the end of the day. You talk about uh, the importance of stigmatization in the paper. Um, and you say that online public shaming actions are presented as stigmatizing individuals because their views might transgress certain social norms. So you just gave the example here of, of you know, the conservative viewpoint that, that transgresses kind of progressive values. Um, and this is kind of norm patrolling by stigmatizing another person that, that distinguishes online uh, public shaming from other types of activities. So, so tell us a little bit more about stigmatization and why that's different from trolling, harassment, stalking, or doxing, if at all. Great. Um, so the stigmatization here is really specifically targeted at one thing, right? And that's the person's character, their moral character and their moral standing. It's not targeted at what they said, because that would just be criticism. And that's perfectly fine. And, and even strident and even abusive criticism isn't a problem in terms of online public shaming. It need not be. It might be a problem in other terms, like in terms of respect in other senses, but not in terms of online public shaming. Uh, it's precisely that lack of, uh, or, or I should say, it's precisely that attempt to identify and characterize the individual's character as deeply morally problematic and worthy of exclusion that's the problem. Now, if we take other practices and phenomena like doxing, trolling, um, and just general harassment and online abuse, they are distinctive in precisely that, that aspect, but also in the aggregate nature of online public shaming. So trolling typically is intended to rile people or waste their time with some kind of quasi-abusive, sometimes hostile, but sometimes hidden purpose. Uh, it's mainly about provocation rather than about trying to characterize the person's uh, moral character, trying to say that they're not worthy or to stigmatize them. Harassment, well, that's an easy one. It can involve hostile and abusive words, images, direction, uh, persistence in bothering someone who has asked not to be bothered. None of those things necessarily have anything to do with the moral character of the person. They're just an attempt somehow to either 
expend their time or to get at them or bother them or harm them in some other way, not a way to do, not a way referring to their moral character. And um, we also have doxing, which is the release of information in the online world about this person's non-online, or some people would say real life. Uh, so for example, releasing their address, uh, their, their work address, who their employers are in order to get people to write to their employers or cause them problems. Again, that doesn't have, that could just be done for uh, the purposes of blackmailing someone or just causing them trouble. They do often overlap with online public shaming. As you can see, you know, they're quite useful tools if you want to characterize someone as morally unworthy and get them got or get them attacked or get them seen as horrible or tell their employers that they're being publicly shamed and therefore that they should distance themselves from them. So there is an overlap, but they are very different things. It's just that we have to be clear what the different things are and when they overlap, then we can characterize the different layers of problem that are happening towards somebody in terms of the stigmatization of their character. Before we go on to talk about some of the policy implications of your research, which I think yeah. there are, are many, um, I want to understand this concept of, of respect um, that you and Guy focus on in, in the piece. Um, and you say that online public shaming is a, a failure of respect for individuals. And furthermore, it's kind of incompatible with, with due process, um, as you mentioned in the very beginning, the kind of notion that we might be expected in judicial proceedings to have, you know, to be brought before and to have kind of a fair consideration. But let's focus here just on respect. Um, why is respect the right kind of criterion here for you in this piece? So there are examples of shaming people that are still operative today, even in some Western democracies, depending on how you understand Western democracy. So in the United States, in some states, judges have used shaming punishments, right? So there's an example that we use in the paper of a judge that punished an individual for a relatively minor crime, but punished them by having them walk up and down with a sign around their neck saying, I am a horrible person because I did this thing in, in a public space. So that's a shaming punishment. So it can exist outside of the online world. And the reason it engages with respect, shaming generally engages with respect, is precisely because it is about uh, status. And respect is about status, right? So respect is recognizing that someone has a certain kind of status, that they are an equal to you in some sense, not in every way, but they're an equal to you in some important sense, that brings with it a requirement to treat that person with an adequate level of concern or an adequate level of care for their personality, for who they are. Um, and that's why we have standards like anti-discrimination standards. That's why we have standards that uh, speak against abuse of others and so forth, because those things, discrimination, abuse, are activities that go against the status of equals. And that's what we were focusing on with OPS. And the reason that we try to emphasize that is because a lot of the writings on OPS that had happened until we wrote our paper had tended to focus not on respecting the individual and their status, but rather looking at the outcomes of online public shaming, looking at whether they brought good or bad results in general, right? So we had, for example, a paper by Billingham and Parr, which is we, we cite in our paper um, on enforcing social norms and the morality of public shaming. And, and their approach to it is to ask, can we get some really good social norms enforced through online public shaming? And they think you can, right? You can use online public shaming can be used to enforce you know, good behavior between people, interpersonal behavior. And we just thought that that's deeply problematic. Now, they do heavily caveat that uh, that idea by saying that whilst it can be used for that purpose and, and it could be under certain circumstances a, a good thing, it's those circumstances are so rare because of the way that the internet works, et cetera, that it's very unlikely that we'll ever see it. But they still say that it would be a good thing if that were to happen. And that, that was our problem. We don't want to merely focus on outcomes. We wanted to focus on that treatment idea and that equality idea in the status of persons. And if you think about trying to, and this is a kind of last point on that, if you think about trying to translate that into other areas of life, 
even if you could show that an individual who is being, say, racially discriminated somehow has a better outcome, right? Magically has a better outcome as a result. Uh, in my classes, I use the example of uh, a Latina woman who is discriminated in her work, but doesn't know that she's been discriminated by her boss for a, a pay rise. And as a consequence, works harder and does better and gets a promotion or gets a, or gets a job somewhere else. You could say the outcome here is good, right? Because it like made her work harder, et cetera. But actually the real problem isn't the outcome. The problem is the very fact that she was discriminated against. And that's the idea that we're translated we are translating into the online world, which others had ignored until we came along. I think that's one of the really the nicest ideas that, that you set out in the paper is how this particular piece is moving away from, from previous work on online public shaming and, and moving away from the outcomes. Um, it's really easy, I think, for audiences to kind of think about the consequences of online public shaming, loss of job, loss of reputation, um, kind of ostracizing. Um, but you go a step further and you're like, no, it, it's what happens before that um, that yeah. really matters, that, that we really want to focus. And that, that, that does come out nice in the paper. So I encourage our listeners uh, to pick it up and read it. Although if Let, I can quickly yeah, add, go for it. Yeah. if I could quickly add, those other things are really bad consequences as well, right? So, so you get a double whammy, right? So you lose your job, but you've also been mistreated. You lose your job because you have been mistreated. That's a really... A, a, a double layered wrong that you suffered. And whereas the other papers might have said the problem was the losing of the job, let's like balance out how many jobs are lost versus how many norms are enforced. We say there's that problem and there's the problem of the online public shaming. Indeed. Saladin, I want to talk about the policy implications of your research because this is, um, you know, this is an area of, of ripe interest. Um, you cited the example in the beginning. Um, we can look in the internet every day and, and see what's going on. Um, how does this research inform policy debates? Yeah, that's a really good question. I mean, there is a debate happening now in the United Kingdom uh, about a proposed bill by the present government. It's called the Online Safety Bill. And there are proposals within that to try and limit some activities online. Proposals that I have to say I do not think are constructive or useful, uh, such as trying to criminalize online messaging, posting, and activities that in some way lead to psychological discomfort for the recipients. Uh, and in a way, if you think back to what we said earlier, that's more of the, the notion of shaming as an emotion. Um, and it's also deeply problematic because of how subjective that is. That's one of the reasons we stayed away from that idea. It's so subjective that ultimately you could ban any form of speech just because somebody says or even genuinely feels that they have been made in emotionally, um, dis uh, they have been emotionally discomforted by it. So our focus was more of an indirect approach. We didn't want to really directly prevent people engaging in online activity and restrict their free speech. And there is a free speech question here. There's a freedom of expression question. And the idea of online public shaming, if you think about it, is, is not as clear cut around the edges as it could be or, sh or we would like it to be. But that's just the world. That's the world, the way the world is. So an act that might seem like an obvious public shaming act could just be an accident, right? It could be someone just sort of sets off a tweet and says, oh, I hate that person. They're horrible. It's just a bit of abuse and wrong in that sense. But they didn't know or intend that suddenly this is going to blow up into two million people hating on that individual, right? Uh, so we have to be really careful. Um, I mean, there are obvious and, and sort of what we would call paradigm or core cases where it happens, such as uh, compiling a letter where you're collecting signatures to say this person doesn't belong in the community kind of stuff without any form of due process. So the indirect ways to try and deal with it uh, we propose in the paper include things like a right of reply on social media platforms or a form. So, so we have in general good journalistic practice there is a right to reply or a right to commentary, at least. So if you claim something about someone, especially if you're claiming something as strong as that they are a morally repugnant individual, you the journalist will often go to that person and say, well, would you want, do you care to comment on it? And if you formalize that on social media platforms and you made it a, a requirement, a regulatory requirement, 
perhaps also uh, a requirement that they do things like pin a tweet or create a hashtag where it has happened so that it becomes known that this person has been subject to an act of public shaming, this mass act of public shaming, rather than somebody discovering their name, discovering it connected with lots of people saying they're morally repugnant, not knowing what has actually happened, and that's surviving for all eternity, right? Uh, and there's many other kind of uh, policy proposals that, that we put forward, some of them in employment law to do with trying to protect individuals from having consequences of online public shaming where employers try to distance from them. Uh, and that would require employment law regulation and um, legislation in order to, to properly enforce codes with employers so that they don't just react to reputational damage that is actually due to an immoral act perpetrated against individuals. I, clearly, I think there are some, some far-reaching implications uh, from the piece here, and I'd love to talk more about them. But I want to ask, who would you like to read this paper if you had a choice? Ideally, legislators and regulators, uh, as well as the ethical boards of online platforms, mass social media platforms. So we know that Twitter has a board that has a significantly large membership that is supposed to deal with kind of ethical policy and how it operates and whether there are principles that it should apply in order to protect free speech as well as in order to uh, encourage uh, open discussion. And it's boards like those that form policy. We'd like them to, to listen to this, to read this, and to understand that it is an ethical problem because they are responsible for setting up codes and indicating to users of those platforms what is appropriate or inappropriate behavior, even if we don't want them necessarily to stop people expressing themselves, we, we would like them to introduce the idea of online public shaming as a problem into their codes so that it has a name, a public name, and people can know it when it happens in the way that they know lying when it happens, right? Everyone knows that you can say, look, you're a liar. You're lying online and we can prove it. Similarly, we could, we could have a word for this activity and that would help to empower people who are facing it in order for them not to suffer as a consequence. I have two quick final questions for you. Um, could you could you summarize or could you pinpoint what is it you want readers to take away from this piece? Well, the most basic message I'd like readers to take away is don't engage in online public shaming. It's not cool. It's not a cool thing to do. And you, you might think, well, why, why do you need to say that? Well, uh, as we've said, a lot of people think this is a force for good. That's one of the big problems that we faced. And some of the debates that we've had around the paper have been around that. Is the problem that people think this is a way of advancing progress in the world, of getting people to think better, to be better, to behave better, and also to advance their ideas, their ideological stances, and get them out there. And, and many of those people who do that are very worthy people. Their stances are fantastic. You know, they're anti-discrimination, anti-white uh, supremacy. They're anti-injustice you know injustice and inequality. But we want to tell them it's not cool to advance that in this way because actually they're engaging in something that is itself a form of injustice, and there are better ways to do what they do. It's not... The online world should not be perceived as the permission to re-enter Hobbes's war of all against all, the state of nature in which it's a state of nature in which uh, we are raw in tooth and claw in our disputes about ideological questions, uh, and just a state of nature in which we only care about our allies uh, and anybody who is not identified as an ally is seen as an instrument to be acted upon because of their ideological, ethical, or behavioral deviance. I like the fact that we got Hobbes into this. And I was just sitting there reflecting on Hobbes and state of nature <laughs> and, and, and on uh, social media. And, and there's, there's probably another podcast in there. Uh, my final question for you is, um, you know, Having having spent some time on this piece, uh, having chatted about it here, um, anything you would have done differently or perhaps is there a future project on shaming and what would you want to pick up in that? Great question. So I think that 
one of the parts of the paper that is least developed is that final part dealing with potential policy outcomes, uh, regulation, non-regulation, free speech versus online public shaming, uh, codes of conduct for online platforms, etc. cetera. We, we really barely skimmed the surface there. I have to admit that. And that's mainly because we were our activity was focused on just pinning this thing down, first of all, because we, we felt it hadn't been. And I think it would be great to follow up with work, significant work on how you address online public shaming in detailed kind of policy proposals. And I think that would be the thing that we would change or do differently or perhaps do as a different project in future. This has been a fascinating discussion. And I must say, I learned quite a lot reading this paper. And I would uh, encourage all of our listeners to pick up uh, the paper, we'll put it in our show's notes. Um, it's a fascinating read. It's a well-written paper, and I really commend it to you. Thank you, Saladin Mechlin garcia Thank you for joining much. me today. Thank you for inviting Please, me. It's a pleasure. Please do check out Saladin's research on the Department of Political Science's website, and you can hear the latest insight and analysis from Saladin there. We'll provide links to this article and others from Saladin in the episode show's notes. Next week, we're talking to Lucy Barnes, Ben La Lauderdale, uh, on a paper that they've co-authored with Jack Blumenau that has recently uh, been published in the American Journal of Political Science. And it gets into the weeds on public understanding and preferences for government spending and taxation. And just as a way of a sneak preview, the UK public prefer higher taxes in return for increased spending across a broad range of categories. As ever, Make sure you don't miss out on that or future episodes of UCL Uncovering Politics. All you need to do is subscribe. And you can do so on Apple, Spotify, or whatever podcast provider you use. I'm Jennifer Hudson. Our producer is Abby Turner. Our theme music is written and performed by John Mann. This has been UCL Uncovering Politics. Thank you for listening.